It's so important also to help people relate to the problem, the, the difficulty or the distress that they're experiencing because this is something which they are carrying around. It's not, it just seems, it, it feels as if it's inside them. And so we, we developed a, a format of inviting people to kind of stand back from the story and say, well, you've told me this, that, it all started then, blah, 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 affected you in this way, blah, 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 blah. Right, right. To what extent does it distress you? Not at all, or it couldn't be any worse, right? To what extent does it disturb you? Get in the way of you living your everyday life, getting on with your work or getting on with your farm. How does it disturb you? Not at all, or it couldn't be any worse. 10. What about control? To what extent can you control this thing that you've been telling me about? You can't control it at all. 1. 10. It's completely under your control. Now, people have told us, after we've went back and asked them, what was the experience like? They have said, it is as if I stepped back from it, and it was over there. Right? And we said, yeah, that's good, because... It's, it, this is about your relationship with this story. And we did, um, we did develop a, a template for this so that people could say, well, there's this bit of my story, you know, um, uh, my mother never loved me, right? The, there's a different bit was um, uh, I couldn't get on with my, my colleagues at work. You know, there was another bit, um, the voices, you know, the voices were blah, blah, blah. Some people break the thing up into different elements, right? Some people say, well, it's just the whole thing, isn't it? It's just me. And we say, well, you, you want to put the whole thing? To what extent does the whole thing distress you, disturb you? And to what extent can you control it? Or do you want to break it up? And if people say, well, let, break up into different component parts and ask, how does that work for you right here and now? <clears throat> Depends on the individual. So we've, we've kind of pulled back and we're now talking about the person's relationship with whatever brought them here, right? Um, now, it's important to identify personal resources. The problem we have historically um, in, in the kind of psychiatric and in the care system generally is we often start from the assumption that the person has no resources and that's why they need us but it's not true and that's what we want to look for because people live with this madness bipolar disorder whatever it is um, most of the time and only very rarely do they get support and even if they're in a, a, a locked unit along with other patients they're still alone with their demons. We have three simple questions that you might want to think about. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, you might want to think. We ask you, who are the people who are important to you in your life? Think of them right now. Just think of one person who is important to you in your life. And ask yourself, who is that person? And why are they important? Why do I think they are important to me? And you tell us, and then we say to you, so what does that person do for you that no one else can do for you? Uh, and you might well say to us, well, I don't want to tell you that. And we say, but do you know what it is? Yeah. Do you want to make a symbol on here that will remind you of why that person is so important to you. Most people write, you know, my brother Jock, right? Why is he important to you? Well, he's my brother. Yeah, but what is it he does for you? All right, okay. So you want to get, you don't want to have all this nonsense about siblings and parents and, you know, some people who you're married to. Who are the people who by their actions are important to you, right? What things are important to you? Think of the things that you have that are important to you, that you would not want to lose. That if you lost them, it would be a tragedy. Or at least you would feel bereft. 
what, what things are you thinking? You're talking yeah. about values. Or no, no, thing. things. Physical, ah, physical, physical things. things. Yeah, yeah. Right. And you're not thinking about your husband or your brother. <laughs> <laughs> right. What things uh, are important to you? Right. Think of what is important, what things are important. Think of what beliefs you have, what values you have about yourself, about life that are important to you. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not religious. Well, we're not necessarily talking about religion. But you have, you've got beliefs you've, about life, have you not? <laughs> what, like, um, you should treat everybody the way you'd want to be treated yourself. Well, do you believe that? Uh, yeah. Well, that's good. Do you want to write that down? Why is that important to you? Oh, right. So you want to draw out what people's values are and beliefs. Because they're... they're these invisible things which are somehow fueling them. Make a list of these things. Or the person makes a list of these things. Well, why are we doing this? Because these people, these uh, physical things, like the crucifix or a picture of your, one of your loved ones or um, some, something that's been handed down through your family, uh, these are important to you. And these beliefs, these are the things that keep you afloat. When people come into your psychiatric services, uh, you support them. You try and keep them metaphorically afloat. When they are discharged and they go back into everyday life out there, what keeps them afloat? Right. I once, um, 30 years ago, I was... Uh, uh, I managed a community psychiatric nursing team. I had 36 nurses in it. I remember once um, asking a, a nurse um, who was quite kind of full of himself and his work, I asked him how often he saw the people on his list. And he said, oh, I sometimes go in and see Jerome. I mean, he's a, he's a poor soul. I sometimes go and see him, um, you know, twice a week. Yeah, and I, so how long, oh, I'm something's there for half an hour. Right, so twice a week for half an hour, that's an hour. Yeah, yeah. So what does Jerome do for the other 167 hours in the week? He wasn't very happy. The reality is, you know, we think that we keep these people afloat, but yeah, our support might be important. But the important thing is, what have they got as part of themselves and their world that might also help keep them afloat? And if they focus too much attention on us and they spend too much time waiting on the next visit, then they may not be using the other resources. Right? Dr. Irene Whitehall, one of our consumer consultants and now a, a dear friend of her, we saw her last week. Uh, and, um, she's a She's a PhD biologist and has a long history of uh, psychiatric um, care. Uh, she said that um, this was the beginnings of self-management. Um, we thought that was a very appropriate term because this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people get into this kind of self-management. A lot of recovery stuff um, seems, a lot of the stuff that we've read um, seems to begin after the crisis is over. You know, people, uh, they break down, they have to come into psychiatric care, they get all sorts of support and treatment and therapy, you know, and then they go out and then the recovery starts. Well, for us, the recovery starts the minute they come in. The minute you come down onto the beach and see us on the rocks, that's when recovery begins. Um, and this all leads to this um, important launch point. They talk about beginning to do what needs to be done. Um, this is a, uh, an expression we borrowed from the, the, the long, long dead Japanese psychiatrist Shomo Morita, um, who said that, um, uh, you know, it, there was always a, a, a thing to be done next, and it was to do with this passage of time. And so, um, it, it was important to talk about the past because it was setting the scene. 
But the really important thing to do is, well, what are you going to do next? Right? Because that will determine the future. So we end by asking two questions. The person has you know, told us this whole big story. Um, how will you know when this is no longer a problem for you? Or how will you know when you're kind of over this? Right? And people often say, well, when I'm cured. All right, so what, what will be different when you're cured? How will you know you're cured? Right? And again, often people say, well, that, that's a big question. Or I don't know, you should know. No, I, I can't tell you. Well, Bob, <coughs> think about it. Right? So they may, they may tell you what will be different. I'll be able to go back to work. I'll be able to face my mother. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll be able to look my children in the eye. You know, what will be different, right? And then, what would need to change for this to happen? And people often say, well, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? What, what needs to change in me? Well, no, I mean, what needs to change just in your, and, and everything? What do you think needs to change? People might say, well, I, I, I need to be, um, I need to stand up for myself a bit more. Uh, or or um, I need to get on with something else. I, I need to tell the, the voices to just to get out of my life. Uh, but sometimes they say, well, no respect, but uh, you, you, some of your colleagues need to, need to be a bit nicer. In what way? When we should say that, right? Well, you know, and so they will not tell you just about what they might need to change in them, but they might also give you some clues as to what might need to be different in terms of the kind of support that they get. Get to the end of that, and you say, Jerome, thanks very much. Right. I found that very interesting. Now, if you just, I don't know, you want to go for a smoke or you want to go and get a coffee, I'm going to take this, I'm going to go down the corridor, I'm going to make a copy of this, I'm going to bring it back, I'm going to give you the copy so that you, you know exactly what we've talked about um, and you can keep it safe. If, if you're not sure how you're going to kind of keep it safe, then we can talk about that and uh, how you might keep it safe just for you. Uh, if you want to share it with your family and friends, that, that's entirely, this is yours, right? I'm going to put this in your notes so that my colleagues know what we've talked about so that they won't be going over the same thing with you, right? That's what we do. That's what we do with the holistic assessment. That's what we do with the one, one session that we'll talk about in a moment. That's what we do with the personal security plan. So that every interaction is documented exactly in the person's own words and they are given a copy of it and some of them can go away and set fire to it. Some of them can go away and shred it. Some of them can go away and share it with their friends, family, whatever. Right, but the important thing is ownership. This is their story, it's not our story. And we've been privileged to get a copy of this. What do you want to ask about this? We're going to give you time in the afternoon um, to ask general questions, but what do you want to ask right here and now?